and happy Friday. I'm excited to welcome you all to the very first episode of The Royal Report, a brand new show created by Kings fans for Kings fans. We'll be posting a new episode every Friday, so make sure you stay tuned to The Royal Rebound's Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and royalrebounds.com. Make sure you send this video to your favorite Sacramento Kings fan, and let's rise up together. That's right. Happy holidays to everybody out there watching. On today's show, we're going to discuss the Sacramento Kings' first few games from the preseason, as well as their season opener against the Denver Nuggets, the NBA playing without a bubble. But of course, we begin with the James Harden saga. It's one of the hottest topics on the NBA stove today. As we all know, James requested a trade from Houston before the season began, and over the past few days and weeks, the situation seems to be boiling over as Harden has had outbursts at practice with teammates and was recently fined by the NBA for a video depicting him at a club without a mask. So Barry, the question is, we know he's in Houston for now, but where will Harden finish the season? Thanks, Calvin. That, that's a very tough question to answer. Um, you know, I don't know if I see a perfect landing spot for James that's gonna give him everything that he wants um, and give Houston what they want as well. Uh, there's been a few teams mentioned, the Philadelphia 76ers, Brooklyn Nets, um, and the Miami Heat. All three of those teams have uh, a player that could potentially turn into a star um, that Houston has their eyes on, as, as well as some future picks and some other young assets as well. Um, but I don't know if I see him fitting in on, on either of those teams. Um, obviously, Brooklyn has the most. Um, that's probably Houston's preferred trade partner. Um, but you know, I think I would keep an eye on maybe uh, the Portland Trailblazers or the Toronto Raptors. Both of those teams have shown um, that they are willing to take a leap of faith on a player. Um, they're both in contention and they both want to uh, end up on the top of the West. So I would look, I would keep an eye out for both of those two teams. Yeah, that's interesting. I really hadn't thought of either of those uh, teams as potential landing spots for them. I, I agree with you that this is a fluid situation and it, it's just going to kind of have to play itself out. Houston is unfortunately going to have to wait for a team that feels like they need to make the move now. And it's early on, there are a lot of teams that are in the mix, so it's probably gonna drag on for a, a little while here. This situation feels a lot to me like the Jimmy Butler situation in Minnesota, where he came in and called everybody out from the owner to the ball boy and basically forced his way out of there. James maybe isn't being quite as demonstrative uh, in this case, but again, I, I feel like until a team gets desperate enough to make this move, he's going to have to stay put and be unhappy in Houston. I, I agree with you that Brooklyn makes the most sense for both parties. It's the top team on his wish list to go to. They have a ton of depth and a lot of assets, so they could provide a package that Houston would be happy with. And I feel like even after giving that up, still be in contention when they get a guy like James Harden back. Uh, but the thing with them is they're probably never going to be desperate to make this deal. They're going to be one of the best teams in the league, definitely one of the top two teams in the Eastern Conference. So I'm not sure they ever pull the trigger on this, which is why I think a team like Golden State could come out of nowhere and be a dark horse in this situation. We saw them struggle in the season opener against Brooklyn. Uh, they're supposed to get back to their winning ways this year. Obviously, no Clay Thompson is seriously going to hurt that. So they could end up losing a bunch of games early on and feel like they got to do something to shake things up. We know that they wanted to get Bradley Beal in the mix during the offseason, failed to do that. So going after a guy like James Harden could be the replacement to fix that situation. Yeah, if I'm Houston, I'm, I'm looking at the package that uh, the Pelicans got for Anthony Davis and I'm going to want something similar to that. Um, but as this situation spirals out of control, um, you know, his value is, is declining as well. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens in that whole situation. Uh, let's move on to our next topic, uh, the NBA bubble or the, the lack of a bubble um, this year. We saw the tremendous success the NBA had with the bubble finishing out last season. Uh, they had eight regular season games, then the playoffs and the finals. Not a single positive COVID test out of that entire time. Uh, there were some players that broke protocols and had to quarantine in their rooms. Um, but for the most part, the program was very, very successful. 
Uh, Calvin, how do you feel um, no bubble will impact this NBA season? It's going to have a major impact. We've already seen it have a major impact. We couldn't even get through the first full slate of games without one being postponed. So we know it's going to have an impact. And, and I want to say the NBA should definitely be commended on how they handled the bubble situation. They, it was basically flawless. They, they did a fantastic job. However, I think the NBA realizes this, but this situation is going to be vastly different. They have to be prepared for uh, things to change at the, a moment's notice, and it's not going to go as flawlessly as the bubble went. I do uh, want to bring up a few points from the NBA's COVID protocol for this season that I wrote down here. Number one is no criteria as of now for what will prompt a suspension or cancellation of the season, which makes sense. It's a fluid situation, changes every day. I don't think you can really um, put out a statement, especially this early on in the season, as to what will lead to a, a suspension or cancellation. Next, the NBA will and can conduct unannounced um, inspections of team facilities. If players are in their home markets, they're prohibited from going to bars, lounges, clubs, and social gatherings of more than 15 people. As we know, James Harden has already been affected by that. On the road, players can dine out at restaurants if they have approved outdoor seating as well as private indoor seating that would be approved as well. And the league is going to work with the Players Association to provide at least three approved establishments in all markets for players. Uh, but lastly, the league and the Players Association will decide whether taking a vaccine will be mandatory once the vaccine becomes readily available. And I think that's a pretty important point because just like the NBA had a lot of advantages with the bubble situation, this could potentially be another advantage that they have over the other sports leagues like the NFL and Major League Baseball, who we've seen are going to push through no matter what. They've had a lot of positive tests. Um, I didn't think that Major League Baseball or the NFL would have made it through their seasons if you had asked me when they began, but they sure did. And I think the NBA is going to follow suit and do whatever it takes to get these games in. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, Adam Silver has made it pretty clear that the NBA is not going to jump ahead in line in getting its players vaccinated. Um, the Players Association has created a new program to help debunk some of the myths um, regarding the virus and, and getting the vaccine to make players more willing to take it. But I don't think we're going to really have the availability of the vaccine until possibly June or July, um, which pushes us out past the playoffs. So it's really hard to tell what the impact will be on the season. As we saw on Wednesday night, um, the NBA has basically made it that if a team has eight available players, they will be playing. If they do not have eight available players, the game will be postponed. Um, I think that is a formula that will work for the regular season, but I, I've yet to see how that will be affected once the playoffs start. I can't imagine the Lakers would be willing to play a game without LeBron James or Anthony Davis, uh, even if they had had eight available players. So I think there's going to be some movement in that and probably some more clarification on the policies. Um, but there's going to be a big impact on this season um, without a bubble. And, uh, you know, we've seen other sports um, franchises and, and leagues have have pushed forward and moved on. So I'm, I'm sure the NBA will figure out a way to make it work. Um, I just, I have a lot of questions at this point. Yeah, and I do think it's all good and fine right now to, to come out and say that you're not gonna play a game if you don't have eight available players. But this is early on in the season. The NBA has only released half their schedule right now because of the fact that they know there's gonna be schedule changes and they need to, to leave some room for adjustment. We saw it in the NFL. Once, once you get to a point where you are running out of schedule changes, the, the Denver Broncos played a game with a practice squad wide receiver at quarterback because they didn't have any quarterbacks available. But they still played that game. So I, I wonder what the NBA is gonna do if they get to a point later on in the year where they can't reschedule any games. Are you gonna cancel them because LeBron's out? I, I just don't know what you do in that situation. So it's gonna be, very interesting to watch. And you know, the, the season's already shortened. There's only 72 games. So if games do get canceled, it might be something similar to the bubble where not every team's gonna play the same amount of games and we're just gonna go based on win percentage. Um, but that's still yet to be seen. 
Uh, we'll be right back after a quick break, and we'll jump right into the Sacramento Kings preseason. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. It's time to talk about everyone's favorite team, the Sacramento Kings, where we'll take questions from our fans. Let's get the first one from the announcer. How would you grade the Sacramento Kings preseason? So first off, I want to just say how excited I am that basketball is back. Uh, the Kings had four preseason games, two in Portland against the Blazers and two at home against the Golden State Warriors. They ended up uh, with a two and two record. Um, some promising plays by the young Kyle guy, including a game winner against his first game um, against the Golden State Warriors. They put up 20 points for the game. Um, other than that, um, I didn't see many spectacular performances by many Kings players. Um, I saw some minutes for Tyrese Halliburton, but he was still kind of getting comfortable and, and used to the flow of the game. Um, De'Aaron Fox didn't do too well in his final preseason game. Uh, I think he scored nine points on like three of 17 shooting and 0 of seven from three point range. I know he's made it a, a big uh, point of emphasis to work on his three point shot and kind of extend that offense out. But if I had to give the Kings a grade for the preseason, I would say probably a C plus. Um, I think it's hard to grade games that don't really matter, especially with a shortened uh, training camp and off season and so many new guys coming to the team. Um, but you know, a C plus is not a bad thing. It's, it's above average. Um, they went 500 throughout the preseason. I don't think we could ask for much more than that during the regular season. Um, and we did see some flashes from guys. But uh, I, I definitely want to see them build off of that, and uh, I'm going to stick with my, my C+. Yeah, Barry, I, I think you got to really take into account what happened this offseason. It was a very unusual offseason. They only played four games, very short training camp, quick turnaround from the end of the year, no summer league uh, for the rookies. So in a normal offseason with performances like this, I would probably give them a C. But I'm going to grade on a curve here because of everything that went on and all the factors um, that went into making this an extremely unusual offseason. I'm going to give them a B minus. They went two and two, like you said. They came back and beat a very good Portland team, a team that a lot of people have picked in the top four of the Western Conference this year after getting blown out by them um, in the game before that. As you mentioned, Kyle Guy looked great. He showed a lot of improvement to me. He seems like he can be more of a playmaker with the ball now instead of just a straight up shooter. So I think he definitely made a really good name for himself and earned himself a spot on this team for a long time. Um, but yeah, it's really hard to, to take those games and decipher any real meaning from them. Uh, there just wasn't a lot of time for anybody to get ready. It's a really, really short period of time where you're playing games as dress rehearsals. Marvin Bagley didn't really play that much. Um, so there, there's not a whole lot that you can really take away from those four games other than they're getting ready for the season. They managed to win two out of four of them and uh, and, and they showed, they played in spurts where they, they looked really good, but nobody played any defense, and, and that's not just the Kings. It, nobody played any defense for any of these preseason games in the NBA, and that's kind of how it's expected to go anyway. So I, I will give, still give them a B minus just because of all the factors that went into um, the offseason, making it super difficult for a lot of these guys to get ready. Yeah, I was really excited to see Harry Giles play um, on the Blazers, so I was happy to see him those first two games. Super proud of that guy. I think he's going to have a great season. And then as you mentioned, Kyle Guy had a great preseason. Uh, it'll be um, still yet to be determined on how many minutes he's going to play um, now that we have three official point guards ahead of him on the depth chart. Um, It'll be interesting to see how much how much time he actually gets during the regular season. But uh, let's go ahead and jump into our next question. What was your biggest takeaway from the season opener versus the Nuggets? There's an awful lot to unpack from this game. The Kings gave us an absolute thriller in their season opener going on the road at the Denver Nuggets, a very, very good team in the Western Conference, winning in overtime 124 to 122. 
Barry, I'll say this. There were three things that I was looking for going into this game. Number one, is De'Aaron Fox actually ready to take that next step and become an all-star like everybody expects him to? Number two, what were the Kings gonna look like on the defensive end? And number three, were they gonna play fast like, like Monty McNair and Luke Walton have said they're gonna play? And they checked all three of those boxes. I know it's only one game, but De'Aaron Fox, I thought he was pressing a little bit and forcing things in the first quarter, but he totally settled down after that. He was very, very smooth for the rest of the game. He can get by anybody at any time, and he knows that. And instead of forcing tough shots at the rim, he ended up stopping, jump stopping in the middle of the lane late in the game, either dishing it off to an open uh, guy underneath or taking that mid-range uh, floater or jumper. Defensively, they played really, really well. I, overall, I would say um, you clearly saw that getting Marvin Bagley back, having him back in the lineup, having the length and size inside, and Hassan Whiteside added to that as well, but. Marvin Bagley defended Nikola Jokic about as well as, as you can, really. And Jokic still had a triple-double, but Bagley made everything difficult for him. And they did really, really well on the glass, too. Sacramento had 17 offensive rebounds in that game. And then finally, they played fast. They pushed the ball even after a make. They got out and they ran. And one important thing I was looking for, too, in that was when you play fast, you can't turn the ball over too many times. They did commit 14 turnovers, but that's, to me, an acceptable number if you're gonna play as fast as, as this team wants to play. And then finally, my, my overall biggest takeaway from the game is simply this team looks like they've got a lot of depth, finally, and length on the defensive end. They seem like a collective unit. They played nine, 10 guys deep, and when you think about the best teams in this league, Brooklyn, uh, Milwaukee, certainly the Lakers, the Clippers, even the Nuggets, all of those teams, Miami, they all are really deep. They can play 9, 10, 11 guys. That's how you win in this league now. You can't do it with a starting five that maybe has two all-stars, um, but you don't have much else behind that. They, the Kings had seven players in double figures in this game. They had three players score at least 21 points. Very, very balanced. Uh, there, there was a lot to be happy about in this game for Sacramento. What did you think? I think my biggest takeaway from the game is uh, Tyrese Halliburton is, is for real. Um, you know, his confidence was contagious. Uh, you could see him on the court there making plays. He had a couple big threes later on in the game, had some great passes. Um, he was on the court in crunch time in the fourth quarter, and he played like 30 minutes in the game. Um, so that was my biggest takeaway. Um, I, I was really happy with the entire team effort. Um, De'Aaron Fox played great. Um, he finished, he's getting much stronger. Um, he finished at the rim with contact, got a couple and ones. He made a couple three point shots. Uh, I was really happy with Bagley. Um, he was active on both the offensive and defensive glass. He seemed to always be in the middle of everything and, and just a ball hog going after the ball. So. Very happy to see him out there. Uh, I think Harrison Barnes had an amazing game. Um, made a couple really, really big plays at the end there. Steal. Um, so very, very happy with him. And, you know, Corey Joseph. Early on in the game, I felt like he was kind of pushing things and made a couple bad plays early on. Um, but he he scored a bunch in the first quarter. And, and his defensive presence and his leadership really showed through um, in the game. Um, it was a tough first half, seemed like the third quarter, the Kings finally started to break away, um, get some distance, start running. They got some defensive stops. Um, so, you know, I was really happy with, with the whole group. It, it was a great team win. Um, I, I didn't forget to mention Buddy Heald. Uh, he shot, he didn't shoot too well early on in the game, but he's a shooter, shooter shoot. Um, and he made some big shots later on in the game, including a uh, game winner in, in overtime. Um, I thought it was really interesting that the crunch time lineup for Luke Walton was uh, De'Aaron Fox, Buddy Heald, Tyrese Halliburton, um, Harrison Barnes, and Rashawn Holmes. Um, and we saw Rashawn foul out and they put Bagley in and then he fouled out shortly after. And, and then, you know, they threw the, the new guy in there, um, Hassan Whiteside, who is a huge guy. He's huge. Um, and really makes a big impact on defense. Um, he, 
he allows the wings to play more aggressive. And I think he is a big reason why Harrison Barnes ended up with that steal um, towards the end of overtime. And, you know, Buddy Heald doing, doing what good players do, follow up the play, don't play till the whistle. He said he thought it was, it was maybe a foul, um, but he just put it up anyway. So very happy with the win, excited for the season. Um, and just, yeah, overall, good performance by the Sacramento Kings. I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, it was great. And, and again, you said Whiteside coming in for both guys who, who fouled out ahead of him, Rashawn Holmes and Marvin Bagley. That just speaks to the depth um, that the Kings have now. And, and it, it, they, really, they really impressed me. I know, again, it's only one game. It's hard to get too excited about it. But they went on the road. They beat a great team. Uh, and they, they stuck with it. If the Kings are going to take that next step, to become in a playoff team, you have to find a way to win close games and you got to stay in games on the road. They went almost down by 10 right before halftime, but they were able to close the gap. They got it to, I think, seven by halftime, stayed, uh, stayed within the game. I was really surprised that the you talked about the lineups. Um, Luke Walton threw a ton of different lineups out there, which again speaks to the depth that they have, which is great. But I was really surprised that we saw Corey Joseph, De'Aaron Fox, and Tyrese Halliburton all on the court at the same time for as long as they were. Were you surprised by that at all? Yeah, I, I was surprised. And, and I thought that that was the crunch time lineup that he was going to go with. And then he ended up pulling um, Corey Joseph, I think, with about two and a half, three minutes left and put Buddy Heald in there for some more spacing. Um, but, you know, I also forgot to mention uh, the debut of our our new uh, commentator, uh, he goes by the name of Mark Jones. Who? Mark Jones. And my favorite quote uh, from the night, I know everybody appreciated the, the Doug Christie, no Fox given quote, but my favorite quote of the night goes to Mark Jackson, uh, De'Aaron Fox. Mark Jones. Mark Jones, sorry. De'Aaron Fox is reaching in his bag, um, reaching in the bottom of the bag where the fries are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mark uh, has obviously been doing this for a long time, and, and him and Doug, I think, are going to have a lot of fun together throughout the course of the season. So good to see the Kings playing well on the court, and good to see the commentators having fun back at Golden One Arena for sure. Let's go on to the next question. What chance do the Kings have of making the playoffs this year? Oh, the tough questions keep coming at us. You know, every year I feel like the Kings have a chance to make the playoffs. Um, this year is no different. I'm very excited for this season and especially with the opportunity to potentially have a play-in tournament. Um, if we are not the eighth seed at the, at the end of the season, um, works towards our advantage. So I would say the Kings have a good shot at making the playoffs, but it really depends on how the next 20 or so games go. Um, if we are competitive, I think that we will build off of that. But if uh, the wheels start to fall off the bus, um, I think that they might cash in the rest of this year for the opportunity at a high draft pick. Yeah, it, the West is tough, man. I mean, there's no way to get around that. I think the Kings, as we mentioned before, they looked very good in their season opener and there's a lot to, to be excited about. But man, is it grueling out West. It, every night you're gonna face somebody um, who thinks they're a playoff team and who is a playoff team. I mean, if you think about it, Lakers, Clippers, Nuggets, uh, Trailblazers, Suns, Mavericks, the list goes on and on and on. And, and you only get eight teams in there. I, I do realize there's the playing tournament this year, which is great. Uh, I think that's an exciting thing, um, but ultimately, the the play-in tournament only decides the final eight teams. So while it is the playoffs, it's almost not the playoffs at the same time. Kings won 31 games last year, and that wasn't good enough to get in. Um, and that's with the bubble and all that, the extended um, eight game play-in essentially. So do I think they can win more than 31 games this year in a equal 72 game season, just like we had last year? Yeah, they definitely can. Um, but it's going to be awfully tough because not only are all of those other teams that I just mentioned were they playoff teams last year, minus Phoenix, but they've all gotten better. And you can make the argument that Sacramento's gotten better as well, but how much better and are they comparatively getting better with those other teams? Um, 
We know Dallas is going to take it probably a step forward this year. Everybody likes Luka Doncic to win MVP. He would probably be my pick right now. So it's a very difficult question to ask or to answer rather. And I do think what you said about the Kings getting off to a hot start is super, super important. They have to. Yeah, and I think health is going to be the biggest thing for uh, most teams in the West. Um, I know Dallas has shown a lot of a lot of potential, but you know, last year in the playoffs, they lost a, another guy in Porzingis. It wasn't available due to injury. Um, we saw what happened to the Golden State Warriors already. Um, the Rockets, it's uh, still yet to be seen whether they will be a playoff team, but their two stars, not including James Harden, are both guys coming off of injuries. Um, and then, you know, with the Kings, we have Marvin Bagley, who's been injured the past couple years also. So if he can stay healthy, I think the Kings will be extremely competitive. And um, it depends on what happens with these other teams. Yeah, and speaking of those other teams, all we just mentioned almost every team in the Western Conference didn't even talk about New Orleans or San Antonio. So that just goes to show right there how difficult this, this conference is. So, but let's move on take the next question. Will the Sacramento Kings make any moves before the trade deadline? Another difficult question to answer this early in the season, but um, I, like we talked about previously um, with the Kings' chances to make the playoffs, a lot of this is going to depend on where the Kings stand a month, two months into the season. Uh, in my opinion. I think that if they're competitive, uh, like we saw last night, if they're winning ball games, chances are they might not make a move. I really do think that Monty McNair had a good vision for this team after watching them play on Wednesday night against the Nuggets. And I think that he, this is the way he wants the team to look going forward. So as of right now, I would be surprised if they made a move, but if they end up miss it or uh, you know sliding down the standings a little bit, losing a few games, you might see one of these guys get moved. A lot of people, or uh, Harrison Barnes is a name that is mentioned a lot in trade talks. He's one of the linchpins of this team, I think. I, I don't, if I was Monty McNair, I probably wouldn't want to move him, especially right now. Um, but Corey Joseph is a guy that could end up being moved, especially if Halliburton continues to develop and becomes what everybody thinks he's going to become so that he could get more time on the court. Um, but, it, you know, I, I'm really at this point in the season, because it's so early, I'm going to say that the Kings are going to stick with who they've got and, and try to play this one out. What do you think, Barry? Yeah, I, I think I think you're totally 100% right in the fact that it's going to depend on what the record looks like closer to the trade deadline, um, and what contenders are willing to pay for an extra piece to help put them over the top. Uh, Monty may be looking for a mid to late first round pick in next year's draft to get a guy like Belitza. Um, Harrison Barnes could be moved in a salary dump move to help facilitate a James Harden deal or something like that. Um, but you know, for me, I would love to keep Harrison Barnes. I know I've been uh, critical of him in the past and his contract, but seeing him play, I know it was only one game, but seeing him play on Wednesday night was exciting. He filled a need that the Kings have. He was a leader and he was a solid contributor and I think a solid starter. Um, Corey Joseph is a guy to keep an eye on, um, great veteran leader, um, but it, you know, as you said, if Tyrese Halliburton um, is the real deal and he's willing to take up that backup two spot, uh, Corey jo Joseph could be moved to free up some cap space. And you know, I think Bill Eats, I didn't see much from him on Wednesday night. Um, great shooter. Uh, I know he's could be a piece for a team. I don't know if he's exactly what the Kings need, but if Bagley and Holmes can stay healthy, I don't see much of a need for Bill Eatsa this year. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think he's him and, and Corey Joseph, although Corey Joseph brings a lot of veteran leadership to the team and he played really, really well the other night. Those two guys feel like the most likely to me. Um, if there's going to be somebody who, who ends up being put together in a deal for this team. I think you really saw the value of Hassan Whiteside. We know how much Monty McNair likes him um, and the value of having those three bigs, Holmes, Bagley, 
and Whiteside, that depth there. Uh, and then their, their guards are set in stone as well. You know you're not gonna, at this point, you're not gonna move Buddy Heald. There was a lot of talk about that during the off season, but with Bogdanovich leaving, we know that he's gonna be a staple of this team going forward. So yeah, I would say Bielitsa and Corey Joseph are probably the two most likely people to get moved if anyone. Definitely two most likely. I also think that if the Kings are 500 or a little bit better and somebody comes available, maybe they'll swing for the fences, but uh, you never really know in that. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the end of the show here. Um, next week we have four games. Uh, we have a back-to-back -back against Phoenix on Saturday and Sunday. Tuesday night we are playing Denver again, and then Thursday we are playing the Rockets. So we'll join you next Friday for another episode of the Royal Report. Thanks again for joining us and hope you have a wonderful week and go Kings. Go Kings, happy holidays. Happy holidays.